Now, if you look around at the world today, you say, oh my God, this looks like hell on earth. We didn't come from hell on earth. We came from the proverbial Garden of Eden. A garden is the highest level of cooperation of organisms. And then look what we've done here. Look at this world that we end up with today. Look around, we are in hell right now. This is actually prognosticated in the Bible's book of Revelations where they talked about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Those four horsemen were represented by disease, famine, war, and death. Is this an inevitable conclusion to our world? Or is there an alternative opportunity? Conventionally, the concept of apocalypse is a very scary thing, a breakdown of the world as we know it. The original uh, meaning of apocalypse in Greek means an unveiling, an uncovering of knowledge that we haven't seen before. And this is what we're facing right now because the new knowledge that we're being exposed to will take us from a destruction into the creation of a better, more functional world. Let's go back and understand the basic nature of a civilization. A civilization is based on a set of truths that are understood by the people of that civilization to be a valid understanding of the world. And when a truth of the civilization changes, so does a civilization. A civilization is characterized by its culture, its behavior. But where do these behavioral norms come from? Well, in the previous civilization, they came from religion, which gave us a bunch of beliefs about spirit, God, and the planet. And the church had a wonderful understanding of itself called infallible knowledge. This is the belief that whatever the church was saying was direct from God and it was absolutely true. Well, this would only work as long as the knowledge was found to be infallible. But if something upset that knowledge, it would actually throw a monkey wrench into the civilization. And in 1543, a priest by the name of Copernicus revealed that some of this infallible knowledge was quite incorrect. Remember, the belief of the church was that the earth was the center of the universe and all the stars, the sun, the planets were all revolving around the earth. Copernicus tried to calculate a calendar based on this belief, but it didn't work. He actually went back to the age of Ptolemy in Egypt and found out that the sun, according to the Egyptians, was the center of our particular universe and that the earth was revolving around the sun. When Copernicus put the sun into the center of the universe, he was able to accurately predict the dates of all the ceremonies for the church. However, in doing so, he created a heresy. The significance of Copernicus's work is that it broke the idea of infallibility and offered an opportunity for new ideas to come into the world outside of the dogma of the church. There's an old saying that we're all familiar with, knowledge is power. I go, yeah, that's a very true statement. But let me also say the statement in a different context. A lack of knowledge represents a lack of power. So if we don't have certain knowledge, then we become powerless in the field where that knowledge is applied. We now recognize that four fundamental beliefs that have shaped the culture and what we call the civilization of scientific materialism, four fundamental beliefs that have shaped this culture are found to be flawed or outright wrong. And as a result, civilization is expressing a lack of power by adhering to incorrect stories. I refer to these four basic principles that are flawed as the four myth perceptions of the apocalypse. When we use the term myth, what we mean is actually a belief that we bought to be true. Whether it's true or not, we own it as truth, and as a result, we create a world based on that myth. Now, if the myth is false, then the world that we create is not going to be in harmony with real life. What beliefs did we buy that are now wrong and have taken us out of the harmony on this planet? This is a list of the four myth perceptions that has misdirected civilization. Myth number one is the belief in Newtonian universe, which is a separation of matter from energy and then emphasizing matter as primary. Myth number two is the belief that genes control our biology, which is a belief that makes us victims of the heredity of the genes that we receive from our parents. Myth number three and four are predicated on the Darwinian theory of evolution, with myth number three being the fact that evolution is driven by random mutations, accidents, and as a result, is there any purpose for our being on this planet? No. 
And myth number four is another extension of Darwinian theory that says evolution is driven by a competition for fitness and the struggle for life, which then means that we are now competing with each other to survive rather than recognizing unity and wholeness. Well, let's start with myth number one. And that's the belief that Newtonian principles, Newtonian physics, are the principles that shape the unfolding of our world and the universe in which we live. Newtonian principles actually divide the universe into two realms, a physical, mercurial, mechanical realm versus an invisible, energetic realm. Being humans made out of matter, then we are supposed to conform to the material realm laws provided by Newton. We just become physical machines but we ignore the relevance of the invisible realm around us, which formerly was referred to as the spiritual realm. So we live in a world without spirituality. We live in a world of materiality with the purpose of what? Getting more and more matter, more and more material to reveal how powerful you are in this world. Myth number one, the Newtonian belief of a material-based universe is incorrect based on the new science of quantum physics because matter appears to be an illusion. When we look into the structure of the atom, it turns out there is no particular structure that we believe, but it's actually an energy vortex, that everything is energy. And the significance is this, energy cannot be separated. Energy represents unity. All energy and all individual things that we see as matter are all energy connected to each other. Quantum physics is the most valid science on this planet. There is no science that has been tested and affirmed to be more truthful than quantum physics. We have to start recognizing a unity rather than a separation in the material world, the old belief. A second belief that turns out to be false is the belief in what we refer to as genetic determinism. The belief in genetic determinism, which is the belief that genes determine the characteristic of our lives. Well, as far as we know, we didn't pick the genes we came with. Also, if we don't like the characteristics we have, we can't change the genes. And then add on top of that, the belief that genes turn on and off by themselves. And then we start to recognize, oh my goodness, our lives are controlled by factors that we have no control over. That genes control us and we don't control them. We become victims of our heredity. Well, guess what? That belief is totally false because we now know there's a new science. It's not called genetics, it's called epigenetics. In genetics, the genes control our life. In epigenetics, it's important to understand the meaning of the word epigenetics, and that is because epi means above. So what does it mean? The characters that we express are controlled above epi, above the genes. Now we know that our consciousness and our response to the environment is what controls our genetics. Through my consciousness and my response to the environment, I can change my genetic activity. I can either enhance my genetic expression or even unfortunately with negative consequences, I can destroy myself with diseases just because of the action of my mind. But the action of the mind is under my control. So I'm not a victim of my genetics, I am a master of my genetics. And as if we understand this, then we wouldn't be facing a healthcare crisis that is undermining civilization at this moment. We would be powerful enough to control our own lives, our own health, our own vitality. A third belief that is now found to be flawed is connected to Darwinian theory. Over millions of years, accidental mutations with positive mutations being selected, negative mutations being eliminated, has led to who and what we are in this world today. So there's a very important understanding about that and it's based on this. If random mutations are the source of evolution, the start of an evolutionary process, random by definition means accidental, if we're here by a whole series of accidental mutations, then what, if any, is the purpose of humans on this planet? And we start to recognize very simply, there is no purpose to human civilization if it was all random mutations that initiated our evolution. Just for example, if a particular mutation that made us human didn't accidentally occur, what would be the result today? Well, it turns out this is not really true, that Evolution is actually based on adaptation, that an organism will adjust its genetics to conform to the environment. And in regard to that, just think of humans at the top level of this adaptability. 
Humans can live in any environment on this planet. How come? And the answer is because we can adapt and it's not an accident. It's a purposeful change. Oh, life is a purposeful change? What is the purpose of our existence on this planet? The garden that we evolved from? Every organism that evolved in that garden participated in keeping the wholeness and the cooperation expressed as a garden. We evolved in that garden, and as the indigenous people of this planet already knew and lived, they said, oh, we are in a garden, and that the role of humans is to be a gardener in that garden. We must learn now to live in harmony with the garden and actually return to being gardeners. That is the function that we had to keep balance in this beautiful planet that we arrived in. Myth number four happens to be the belief that evolution is driven by competition against one another. This is a false understanding, and it actually isn't due to Darwin, it was before Darwin. At the end of the 1700s, there was a philosopher by the name of Thomas Malthus. He came up with the idea that plants don't reproduce faster than animals reproduce. I go, why is that relevant? Well, if animals are living on the plants and animals are reproducing faster than the plants, there's gonna be a point where there's not gonna be enough plants for all the animals that exist. The net result meaning a competition for survival. And that's where the whole idea in Darwinian theory comes from, that we are in a continuous struggle for survival with a competition for fitness, as if there won't be enough for all of us, and therefore we have to be the winner in that challenge. However, this is a completely misunderstanding of the truth, that we now recognize that evolution is not based on competition, it's based on cooperation. It turns out that animals and plants get into an equilibrium and they balance with each other. And it's an interesting fact, for example, in animal reproduction, every mating pair, when they reproduce, actually reproduce two offspring that will survive to mate again. Now, a clam may have a thousand eggs, but only two clams are going to actually mature. What is the point? The illusion of competition is not a valid insight in the world of nature. Nature is built on cooperation. Nature is built on unity, that all organisms come together to live in harmony, hence a garden. And in fact, if you actually go back and understand the root of the word competition, competition meant to strive together, to work together to create a better end result rather than a winner-loser mentality that we have bought into today. Competition means working together, and that's what we need to do now. These new alterations to the four myths change our beliefs. Yes, but then understand this, when the beliefs change, so does culture. And so we are in a transition period right now. As we look at the world crumbling all around us, we have to own a very simple fact. We're not passive victims in this process. We are the people that are creating this devolution. And therefore, we are being called on by nature at this moment to say, you better change the way you're living on this planet or you won't be here in the very near future. So the new beliefs that we're talking about, the new understandings of the former myth perceptions, the new ones help us move from the hell on earth that we have just created to actually experiencing heaven on earth. And when you understand this, then the nature of the honeymoon effect becomes apparent. And that is simply this. Our consciousness and our subconscious programs make life a struggle. And for most of us every day, our life is blah, 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 working, working, struggling, struggling, and struggling. But then realize this, there's a time where you might meet someone and you fall in love. Within 24 hours of falling in love, the blah, blah, blah world you experience absolutely changes to a world of heaven on earth, the honeymoon effect. Heaven on earth was always here. Well, if it's always here, then how come we're experiencing the hell of this world falling apart? And the answer is simple. We built a cultural behavioral system on false understandings of science. We're facing an evolution. It's not a passive process. It's a participatory process. Are we going to work together to create harmony and a new garden? Or are we going to let this go by the wayside 
as we face a looming extinction. It's up to us. I have high hopes for us because as the new science reveals, we have the power to change our lives and the world in which we live. And when we become aware of that power through the knowledge, and knowledge is power, then all of a sudden the world will change and we will end up having heaven on earth for as long as we want to live on this planet. Thank you.